My name is Brandon Ziski, the senior pastor at Pleasant Valley Church. And I just want to say thanks for taking some time out of your day to watch the message that you're about to listen to. This past Sunday, we as a church had a great celebration where we came together to rejoice in the risen one, the one who conquered the grave and gave us life in him. We spent our time in the John chapter 4 where we discovered Jesus offering the gift of God to the woman at the well. And this story is truly a resurrection story because the gift of God, as you will see, is the new life. And as you listen to the message and as you watch the drama, I want to encourage you to open up your heart to him. Would you be willing to receive the gift of God? Would you be willing to receive the life that Jesus is offering you, even now as you watch this? But before you get into it, I want to say thanks to a few people who put in a lot of work this Easter to make our Sunday service excellent. I want to say thanks to Pastor Chad, who not only put a lot of time into the music and the lighting, but also who came up with the drama and wrote the script. I want to say thanks to Sue DeGallier to help coach and to work alongside the drama. I want to say thanks to Andrea Swanson, who was our actress. I want to say thanks to Brian and Sherry Sauter, who worked really hard in creating the well that you will see on the video. And I also want to say thanks to the preaching prep team that helped me come up with different ideas and thoughts and illustrations for the message that you're going to hear. And I also want you to know too that the sermon that, that I felt um, to give to Pleasant Valley Church was adapted and greatly influenced by another sermon that I heard months ago that greatly influenced this message that you're about to hear. May you be blessed and may you encounter the one who changes everything. It's you. I, I'm sorry. I didn't know anyone else was here. Um, I didn't expect to see you or anyone else here. Um, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I just realized I forgot what I came here for. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at talking. There hasn't been much to talk about. For years, really. No one usually talks to me. Until today. I come here every day at noon when the sun is blistering hot and beating down at my face. Anything to avoid the condemning looks of those proper women with their perfect husbands and their perfect families. They look at me like I'm trash. They don't say it out loud to me, but I hear them whispering and hissing under their breath. There she is, that woman. I don't care, I am strong woman, I don't need them. But I, am that woman. I don't guess I blame them. Who wants their children hanging around an adulteress? I've made my choices, but I do think of what could have been. What would it be like to have a friend? Someone to speak with kindness to me who can't wait to tell me the latest story from their house about how their little ones are growing up so fast, to sit down and have a meal with my family. How many times have I heard their laughter from my window? To have joy, happiness, just like they do. To hear someone say my name and it not be a curse. Someone came to our well today. I've learned to keep to myself, but this man, yes, a man, and more than that, a Jew, speaking with me, a Samaritan, they hate us. 
And truth be told, we don't care for them either. But he spoke to me, asked me for a drink. I just about fell into the well. He just, I just stared at him, looking like a camel. <laughs> and he looked at me, but it was with kindness. I can't remember the last time someone looked at me that way. He saw right through me, knew my deepest secrets. <laughs> my deepest secrets. But he, he didn't turn away. I can't explain it. It was as if his words, his very presence, I don't know, it was like becoming a little girl again. I thought, this must be what it feels like. Love. What am I saying? I don't know. I have to be going. He's still in our village. Everyone wants to listen to him. You know, you should come. You should meet him. Maybe, maybe he will see you as well. You know, this can't be the story that this woman dreamed of telling when she was a little girl, right? When life is innocent and you're five, six, and everything's in front of you like it's a blank canvas waiting to write out the story that you're going to live out. You see, as a little girl, this now woman, she had dreams of palaces after all because she was a princess, her dad would look at her and be like, oh, you're my little princess. You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. And she had this twinkle in her eye that would just rob your heart. She imagined meeting Prince Charming and just imagine getting on the horse and riding off in the sunset with the man of her dreams. And as she got older, she became a little bit of a realist and said, we don't need to ride off into the sunset, but I do need Mr. Wright. Her story is waiting to be written in front of her. Imagine with me for a moment. One day, she goes to the well in the early morning with all the other girls and women of the village because that's what you do. And out of nowhere, she sees this guy out of the corner of her eye and she's like, whoa. And she does a second look, you know, like, huh. But she couldn't stop stealing glances at him. And all of a sudden, she just got nervous, like, oh my gosh, I don't want him to notice that I'm staring at him. But <laughs> he noticed and their eyes connected and sparks flew. Love at first sight. He would go to her hut and ask her dad that he, if she, he could marry her. And she said, yeah. Came the wedding day. It was beautiful and it was picturesque. Almost as if you were getting the feeling that they were going to ride off into the sunset together. But it didn't take too long for that story of hope and dreams to turn into a dark drama, a nightmare. Because in just a few short months, this, this lady realized that her marriage was over. She started to ask the questions to herself. What was it? What did I do? What did I say? Am I not good enough? Am I not pretty enough? What was it? And she didn't know. And you see, this is where her story goes from bad to worse. Because she's living in a culture where women don't have a lot of rights. And if you were divorced, it was usually the woman's fault. And, and if you were divorced as a woman, you're considered damaged goods. The chances of getting remarried are slim to none. And you can imagine the thoughts that she was saying to herself, what happened to those dreams? What happened to being daddy's most beautiful girl about being a princess? And the reality is, now she's easy prey. She's damaged good. She's not good enough. And so she begins to lower her standards because the thought of being alone is just too hard to handle. So she settles for another guy and she remarries him. And not too long after that, divorced, second time. She remarries again for the third time and divorced for the third time. And you can imagine the story that she's starting to tell herself. I am worthless. I am damaged goods. And her heart has become numb. But yet she just can't stop being alone. She just can't because it wasn't part of the story that she had when she was a little girl. So she remarries for the fourth time. 
The fourth time she's divorced, she's becoming accustomed to being used and abused. And she's even wondering if she's actually in a prostitute now. She's married for the fifth time. Fifth time, divorced. You can hear her speaking to herself. What's the point of remarrying again? What's the point? No one wants to associate with me. I'm an outcast. My story is a horror story. But yet she can't stop being on stomach and being alone. So now she just gives herself to any willing customer, to any guy. And you know those nights when you speak to yourself, what happened? This, this is not what I imagined. The guilt, the shame, the secrets that she keeps putting on a, a strong front to, to kind of hide what's going on on the inside. And you can imagine, she goes, I guess this is just how it is. Nobody really knows, but this is it. But in her story, this day, this day something happened to her. Something that restored the hopes and dreams that she had as a little girl where the hope of a new life began to bubble up inside of her, where something like a resurrection happened inside of her. This day, this day, yeah, she met another man. And the funny thing is, if we were to be honest, her story is no different than our story. Her story is really no different than our story. Her story is one of a resurrection where life, her soul, it needed to be revived. It needed to be reborn. She needed to have a resurrection story. It's just like us. Our lives, our souls, we need to be revived. We need to be born again. We need a resurrection to happen inside of us this morning. And there's only one who offers such life, and it's Jesus Christ who died, shed his blood, and conquered the grave on the third day. And what I want to do for us this morning is to take us into her story, because I'm willing to bet that if we opened ourselves up to God's word, that we would find ourselves in the same, same tune, the same song, and the same step as this woman. And my heart and my prayer for all of us this morning is that we would have ears to hear. So if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to turn with me to John chapter four. If you don't, that is okay. We will provide the verses on the screen behind you. Now, John chapter four is not your traditional Easter story because usually you want to talk about the literal story of the resurrection. But as Chad talked about earlier, is that Jesus described himself that he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Which means that's who he is. In other words, any story where Jesus is, is a resurrection story. And so it helps us think through, who is Easter for? It's for people like you and like me and like the woman at the well. So let's start this morning by looking at verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, John the Baptist, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, which is kind of his home base. And he had, now this is interesting, he had to pass through Samaria. Now, in order for me to kind of paint the scene of what's happening in the story, I need to show you a little bit of the, con the historical construction here. Because back in those days, Jews and Samaritans, they didn't get along. There was a 700-year period of extreme hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. And the Jews had a lovely word for the Samaritans. They called them dogs. That's what they called them. They're dogs. They're half-breeds. There was racial tension between the groups. There was religious tension between those two. In fact, if anyone in Judea needed to get to Galilee, they would never, ever go through Samaria. They would literally go out of their way to find their way to, some, to, to Galilee. But in this text, it tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Well, we know Jesus is a good Jew. And we know that because traditionally you go around Samaria. So I asked the question, why did this text tell us that he had to go through Samaria? 
There's intentionality here. There's something profound here that's going on that Jesus needs us to see. Because these Samaritans, they didn't fit the mold. They weren't good Jews. They were half-breeds. They were dogs. You see, Jesus, and here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't deal with religious drama. He doesn't deal with the religious overtones. He doesn't play by the rules of religion. The Jews said, you cannot associate with those dogs. They're not like us. They don't look like us. They are sinful. They are sinners. Do not associate with them. And Jesus doesn't deal with religious drama. He went intentionally through Samaria And as we're going to see, he had someone in mind. Now, I want us to feel this morning, because some of you in this room, you might feel like church is all about religious drama. It's about a list of do's and don'ts and things you have to say and not say, like, thou shall not, thou shall not. If I got to go to church and this and this and this, there's always this bickering. Oh, my goodness, if you can't go to church unless you're a Republican, religious drama, it's all there. Wait, did he just say that in church on Easter? Oh, there's drama. Jesus avoids that because he goes for people. He says that I've come for the sick. Intentionally through Samaria. Maybe this morning, you need to look past all of the religious layers that are in your life. When you look at church, maybe you feel like you don't fit the mold of what church people should be and what church people look like. Maybe you're hurting so much this morning and you're not convinced that there's anything that the church can offer you. You're tore up. Maybe you're just faking it till you make it, kind of keeping secrets in, putting up a facade. But Jesus, he had to pass through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria to meet someone. Listen, this morning, Jesus is coming straight for you. He's coming straight for you. Verse 5, he came to a town of Samaria called Sukkar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which is about noon. Now you got to just imagine this for a moment. So Jesus knows Jews don't go through Samaria, and so he's not dealing with the drama, and he intentionally goes through Samaria, and now he comes to this well, and it's noon. And he says that he's sitting at this well at noon. Now, back in that culture, it's still to this day, not back then, noon is when the sun is at its highest, and it's awfully hot. There's no shade around the well, and as the story tells us, he doesn't even have a bucket to get water, so he's not really at the well trying to quench his thirst. If he was really sitting at the well to rest, he would find shade. I start asking the question, why the well at noon? Was there something that he was thinking? Was there some sort of intentionality that Jesus had? He had to pass through Samaria. He sat at the well at noon. And verse 7 goes to tell us, And there came a woman from Samaria to draw water. And I go, hmm, did Jesus have this in mind the whole time? You see, the woman, this woman had to come to the well at noon because, quite frankly, she can't be necessarily associated with the normal crew. The morning is when they kind of fetch water. And she didn't want to associate with it because she's, you know, not good company. She's damaged good. She gets around She didn't want to be around those younger ladies because they knew they were going to gossip about her, talk about her. She didn't want to be reminded about her sin and shame. Now, if you were a Jew and you were hearing this story or read this story, you would be absolutely appalled at this statement. For one, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. So that's strike one. Jesus is known as a rabbi. And rabbis, as we know, aren't really meant, supposed to interact with women. They're not supposed to. So now Jesus is speaking directly to an adulterous woman at noon in a public forum, a little precarious. And he's talking with her. And he says, can I have a drink? Fascinating. Jesus doesn't play by the rules of religion. If he was caught up in the religious drama, he wouldn't be there. He would go right around Samaria, but he's coming specifically and purposely for this woman. 
Verse seven, give me a drink. Now, verse eight, I, I, I imagine her saying these with that sass that women can have. No offense, right? Husbands, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's that little head thing that goes on, right? So I, I imagine, <laughs> I can't do it, but I imagine this, okay? Because there's all sorts of tension here. A guy, a man, at noon, when nobody's around, speaking to a woman who's gotten around. She knows he's a Jew. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, how is it that you, a Jew, like, like that, you know, you got that thing, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. And the text is so nice to give us the parentheses, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She's like, you wouldn't ask me for anything unless you wanted something from me, right? It's kind of like guys, they don't ask you for anything unless they want something type of thing. She, she's guarded. She's protected. This is not normal. You shouldn't be doing this. For one, you're a Jew. Why would you ask me for anything? And Jesus in verse 10, oh, this is so good. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you knew who I am and what I'm offering you, you would ask me for this living water. And she doesn't get it because at verse 11, she responds, well, sir, She's looking around. She's very observant. Sir, you have nothing to draw the water with, and the well is deep. So where do you get that living water? She's looking around. She's like, you don't have a bucket? Where is this well that you're talking of? You asked me for a drink, and now you're offering me water? This is bizarre. She can't quite piece this together. I'm willing to bet that she's wondering if he has other intentions. I got got to come back to this. If you knew the gift of God, the gift of God, that's what Easter is all about. He came through Samaria. He intentionally sat at this well at noon, knowing she would come because he wants to offer her the gift of God. And a gift, if you think about it, implies that someone is giving you something that would benefit you, bless you, add value to you, add worth to you. In order for the gift exchange to be proper, one must take that gift and receive that gift and unwrap that gift and to kind of embrace it. If you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask him, This is so fascinating because she came to a well with her bucket to get water. Like, she wasn't expecting to have her life touched that day. This is what she does. It's noon. I have to avoid people because I'm that woman. I can't be seen. But she had no idea that that day she was going to have an encounter with God that would change everything. And you got to feel for her a little bit. She had no idea that she was going to meet her maker that day. And I'm willing to bet that some of you in this room this morning have come to church on Easter and you're not expecting God to do anything in your life. In fact, you might even wonder if there's anything to it. You're not expecting God to meet you. You're not expecting God to even be waiting for you. You came at Easter because this is what you do. It's tradition. It's just Easter. This is what we do. But God is going to be offering you and I continually the gift of God. If you knew the gift of God, and if you're open to it, if you're open to it, you're going to discover that Jesus is waiting for you at the well like he was with this woman. And this is so fun because now in verse 12, she really gets a little sassy. I mean, he's just like, this is where that head thing is really going now. <laughs> Are you greater than our father Jacob? <laughs> right? That's how I read that. <laughs> like, you know, I can't do it. <laughs> he gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and livestock. 
I mean, she's really like, I, I'm not getting this. There's some sass there. Are you, are you greater than Jacob? There's tension here. This is religious tension that's going on because she knows he's a Jew. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become, now get this, in him, in her, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He, this is like the best product comparison ever, right? The well is a prop. That's why he's at the well. He's sitting there and he goes, yeah, you'll draw that, you'll drink, and you're going to be thirsty in a couple hours. You're going to have to come back again, get some more water, come back again, get some more water. It's not going to quench your thirst. But if you drink the water that I will give you, it will become a wellspring on the inside of your heart and of your life that will fully satisfy and you will never thirst again. This is what Easter is all about. This is what resurrection is all about. It is so much more that when you die as a believer that your body will be resurrected and you'll go to heaven. It's so much more. The resurrection ensures that we will have life that will start on the inside. The Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 1.27 and he says that there's this beautiful mystery. The riches. The riches. Oh, it's so good. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Listen the water I give you, the well that's going to be there. It's going to be on the inside and it's going to well up to eternal life. What I offer you means you will never need a bucket again. You'll never have to go to another well to draw water again. It will be inside of you. In verse 15, she she still doesn't get it and you can't blame her. Well, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. Sounds like a great deal. Drawing water is hard work, and plus, if I could forget the shame of having to draw water at noon by myself, sign me up. If I never have to deal with my sin and my guilt again, awesome. But she isn't seeing what Jesus is trying to do in her heart. And let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. Neither do we sometimes. Sometimes we don't see what God is trying to do in our lives. Sometimes we face disappointments and pain and confusion and letdown and loss. Sometimes we feel like we're trying and God's not there. He's not answering. And we can sometimes just go, I'm not getting it. I'm not seeing, God, how you're working here. And sometimes, if we were to be honest too, we're afraid that God is a killjoy, that he doesn't really want what's best for us. We're afraid that if we come to God, that life will get boring and we have to become like good Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and this is just what we do. Thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. And it's this world of restrictions and we forget that everything that God does is about resurrection and it's about life. And he's like, listen, Every well in your life that you try to find satisfaction from, desire from, is always man-made. And you're always going to use a bucket to draw water from that thing. He's trying to get her to see her heart. He's trying to help her to see and to understand that he's not talking about literal thirst. He's not talking about a literal well. He's trying to help her see that it's about her desires. It's about her thirst and her lusts and the satisfactions of her life. We do this all the time. We are constantly running to and fro man-made wells. And we're constantly dropping buckets into the well to find some sort of desire, to find some sort of satisfaction in it. And for some of us, it is sex. We're so stuck in that that we go, man, if I had this, if I had this relationship, if I had this thing, then I'd be good. Maybe it's a job. If I had this job, when I get that job, if I get that promotion, then I'll be worth something, this and this. And it's relationships. Maybe it's popularity. Maybe it's status. Maybe I need a bigger house, a bigger car. Once I get that, when, 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 when. And we keep drawing water out of that well and it will never satisfy because when we think, if I get it, then I will be. But Jesus is like, no, listen. You will always be thirsty. 
And he wants her to see in her heart the bankrupt condition of that well that she's gone for. In the Old Testament, there's a powerful passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. That speaks of this exact situation. And God is speaking through Jeremiah. He says, For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Forsaken me. God wants the very best for all of us. And the second thing is they hewed out cisterns for themselves. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. She is not aware that she is so desperately trying to find her desire and satisfaction in relationships. She has no idea that Jesus is the one that she's actually looking for. Now look at what Jesus does to her. Because before she can understand this, And just like us, and before you and I can even understand that Jesus is the well, we need him to show us something. Look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Go get Bob, bring him here. Sounds like a simple invitation, but it's kind of complex. And she says, "Uh, I don't have a husband. It's kind of like a half-truth, borderline lie. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband. (laughs) She's thinking, oh goodness, he's asked for my husband. And she, you can almost get this feeling that she's confronting like her 50 shades of gray. Oh, oh. Also, she's like, I don't have a husband. I'm like, you're right, you don't have a husband. She's like, I'm off the hook. He doesn't know. She's like, okay. <laughs> but Jesus goes, Mwah. he goes one step further. Four, you have five husbands. And the one that you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. And he did this not to condemn her. We think that God is out to get us. Sometimes we think that he's out to get us and to shame us and to guilt us and to judge us. He didn't do that. Why did Jesus confront her like this? I am the resurrection in the life. If that is who Jesus is, then everything that Jesus does has to lead to life. He wants her to confront this. He wants her to speak it out and to go, oh. Not to condemn her, not to guilt her, not to make her feel inadequate, to remind her, yes, you are a failure. That's why I'm bringing that up. He doesn't do that. He goes to that place that she's been trying to avoid and he says to her, I know you are still thirsty. I know. This is a prop for you to see what I'm trying to get at. You have had five husbands. I know all about them. And I know that the guy that you're with right now, your friend with benefits, he's not your husband either. I know. And I know that you're still not satisfied. I know that you're still carrying this guilt. I know that. I know that everyone else has written you off. That you even feel that you're no good for church and religion. I know that. But listen, I have come through Samaria on purpose to come to that well at noon on purpose to avoid the religious drama, to offer you the gift of God. And she does what we would do if our sin was called out. You deflect. And she deflects with the best of them. Verse 19, she goes, oh, I see that you're a prophet. Yep. And she goes, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say you need to worship on this mountain. It's kind of like, you know, we have our religious practice over here, and you have that one's over there. Which one's right? I don't know. Is it this denomination? Is it that denomination? You tell me. If I knew, I would have done it right the first time. I wouldn't have this problem. She's kind of deflecting. And Jesus, in his loving tone, says, woman, tenderly speaking to her. It's not about any of that. He says there's a time that will come when people will worship in spirit and truth. And there's this beautiful verse here. In verse 23 says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. 
The Father is seeking such people. He's inviting people into his relationship, this truth relationship where Jesus is the only way, that he's the only well that could ever bring satisfaction. And the Spirit is, yes, I agree. Yes, I believe. And yes, I'm going to put my faith in him. And here's the beautiful piece of Easter. Easter is God's megaphone to us saying, I am seeking you. You are not seeking me. And if you are open to it this morning, you will discover Jesus waiting at the well where you go to to draw satisfaction from. He's waiting. And he wants you to show you how bankrupt this is to say, I am the well. Receive this gift. You will never thirst again. In verse 25, she's still trying. <laughs> the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. She's showing off that she's religious. She understands something. And I know that when he, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who will save the world, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus responds in verse 26, I am he. I am the well. I am the one who you are looking for. I'm the one that you've been desiring without even realizing it. It is me. I can give you what others can't give you. I can do for you what nothing can do for you. I can give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. I can give you worth, a new identity, a purpose. I can give you a joy that cannot be shaken or stolen for a life. I will give you a security in my love because I will adopt you as my son and daughter. I will give you an anchor in your soul. I am he. And verse 27 comes after that dialogue. His disciples show up and they go, what? What is Jesus doing? He's talking to a woman at the, the what's he doing? And they don't say anything because they know if they did, Jesus would make them feel foolish. The woman, verse 28, she leaves her jar and she runs into the village. She runs towards the very people whom she's trying to avoid. She leaves her jar and she runs right to the very people whom she's been trying to avoid. It's almost as if she's telling us like who she met at the well is far more important than what she came to get at the well. And I'm going, oh my goodness. She's running to that village and she says, she, she says, you gotta come see a man. Well, we yeah. To which you know the people in the village said, I'm sure we do. We know about you and your men. Well, we forget about that point. There's no shame in her. Something happened. She wanted them to see. She, she ran right to them like, I met a man. You got to come see him. He called out my heart. And I was like, oh my goodness, something was there. I don't get it yet. And yes, my life is still a train wreck. Yes, I still have issues with men. I know. But at least I put my faith in him. I put my jar down and I believe in something. Could he be the one? And all of a sudden, they, they come to meet Jesus. And I love verse 42 and how they wrap this up. It says, they said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. I am the one I am he. If you knew the gift of God, you would ask him. Jesus had to go through Samaria 
Just like sometimes you have to go through th- some things in your life. He came to that well at noon on purpose to meet a woman at noon so that he could drill a well in her heart. And I know that some, for some of us this morning, we have a hard time grasping the love of God. The Father's love, it's so profound, it's so huge. And I struggled with this for many, many years until I became a father myself. And it was at that moment I started to understand some things. I have three children with my beautiful bride, Carissa. We have three of them, and and, um, my son, Brayden, he's gonna be here to help me out with something this morning. This is my buddy. This is my boy, my only boy. We gotta stick together, right? There's too many females in the house, right, buddy? Yeah. When we first had Cora, and I remember looking at her, I was like, oh, my goodness. How could I love something so much? I was like, and then we had another one. Then I remember Chris and I going, how could we love another one just as much as we love Cora? And then I had Brayden. I was like, this is my boy. Then we had a third. And I started to watch my heart grow deep in profound love for my kids and I was just like, Father, God, is this how you love me? Is this how you love us? This is the best way I can understand it. John 3, 16 is a verse that we know so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And I started thinking about it. What would it be like if I, as a father had to watch my son be nailed to a cross? What would it be like as a father to watch people put nails into my son's hand? What would it be like as a father to listen to a group this size yell, kill him, kill him? If it was me, I would take my boy off and i say, they're not worth it. Uh-uh. They're not worth it. But God's love had to do this. The gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, Jesus had to be born so that he could drill a well in our lives. He had to go to the cross so that he could drill, drill a hole in our lives, in our hearts. He had to be pierced in his side and blood and water had to flow so that he could drill a well in our hearts. He had to be buried and he had to come back from the grave so that he could drill a well in our hearts. For God so loved the world that he gave. Jesus knew when he was at this well, he knew he was going there. And he loved her because he wants her to have life, just like us. He wants us to have life and he wants you and I to know that no well outside of him will ever, ever satisfy But that gift could never be given unless Jesus conquered the grave and rose again on the third day. He knew he had to go through Samaria. Just like he knows what you need. He's waiting for you at your well. He wants you to see where you've been looking for where you've been putting in your heart because he wants to show you a greater desire. And just like it says in John 1, a gift must be received to all those who received him. He gave the right to be sons and daughters. You see, her story is no different than our story. He had to lead her to the cross so she could receive the gift and have that well dug in her heart. We need Jesus to lead us to that cross and to believe. 
This morning, we invite you to come see a man who changes everything. A man who always brings life. Will you this morning leave your jar by that well and go to Jesus and let him drill a well in your heart? Would you join me in prayer this morning? Isaiah 55 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which will never satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast love. My sure love for David. Father, I am thankful for Easter. I'm thankful for the love that you have for us. Your word says that there's no greater love than for one to lay down their lives. Father, I'm thankful that you did that. Lord, I know as myself, as a father, there's no way I would ever let my son do that. But you did, and I'm thankful for that. Father, I pray for those in this room this morning who may have thought this was just your traditional Easter service, not expecting to have an encounter with you. Lord, I pray that if you met with them, you would speak their name to them. They would open up their heart to you. And just like the woman, she didn't quite get it. But she had enough faith to leave her jar and to move one step forward. You say in your word that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe that you died on the cross, that your blood has covered our sin, and you've made us as white as snow. And if we believe in the resurrection, we have this new life, this powerful, victorious, overcoming life in Jesus. You say that if we believe in that, you will drill a well that will satisfy like no other. Father, as we conclude this service this morning, may we be reminded of this amazing grace, this deep and profound 